Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Ulrich, and I'm the director at NYU Washington, DC. I am happy to welcome you to the Abramson Family Auditorium for the fifth and final program in our Democracy Next series in sponsorship with Fairvote. Thanks to Tom and Shruti on our staff to helping organize this, and a special thank you to Shruti. It's her last public event with us as she's transitioning to a new job, so we'll help her celebrate tonight. The future of American democracy lies with its young people, underscoring the urgent need for rebooting how we vote and organize. The millennial generation's voter participation rates are wildly erratic, plunging to remarkably low levels in city and primary elections, and fluctuating erratically in state and federal elections. Central to the problem is our reliance on 18th century electoral laws, 19th century party models, and 20th century systems of political communication. Our panel tonight consists of the nation's leading political thinkers and practitioners who will put their minds to the problem of moving our democracy fully into the 21st century. I am happy to introduce our moderator, Steve McMahon, one of our very own professors here at NYU Washington, DC. Steve is an attorney and co-founder of Purple Strategies. He has his start in politics on the Senate and political staff of Senator Edward Kennedy and has worked on dozens of senatorial, gubernatorial, and mayoral campaigns across the country. Steve has served in senior roles in three presidential campaigns, including Governor Howard Deans, and produced the advertising in support of then-Senate Barack Obama for the Democratic National Committee in the 2008 presidential campaign. For the past 12 years, Steve's principal focus has been on providing comprehensive rep reputation, brand image, crisis management, and issue advocacy campaigns to companies and industries operating in challenging environments. Governor Howard Dean, former DNC chairman, presidential candidate, six-term governor, and physician, currently works as a part-time independent consultant focusing on the areas of healthcare, er, healthcare, early childhood development, alternative energy, and the expansion of grassroots politics around the world. He serves as a CNBC contributor and is founder of the Democracy for America. He also serves on the board of the National Democratic Institute where he focuses on Southeastern Europe and China. Governor Dean began his career in public service in 1982 when he transitioned from a full-time practicing physician to an elected representative in Vermont. He served as governor for 12 years, the second longest serving in the state. Governor Dean left office in Vermont to run for president in 2003, where he implemented innovative fundraising strategies such as the use of the internet, which have greatly changed the way Americans participate in the democratic system. Ann Johnson is the exec executive director of Generation Progress, the youth division of the Center for American Progress. Prior to joining CAP, Anne was a senior campaign specialist at the National Education Association, where she focused on creating opportunities for young members within the union, built grassroots fundraising programs, and man managed numerous member political engagement programs and electoral campaigns. Anne also founded a member candidate development program while at the NEA. Prior to this, she served as national field director for SEIU COPE, supervising a staff of union organizers to develop, and na to develop local and national fundraising and political engagement programs. Originally from Minnesota, Ann was the deputy direct field director in Paul Wellstone's 2002 re-election campaign, and after the campaign, she helped found Wellstone Action, a nonprofit youth political training organization. Through her work, she has become a respected expert on youth issues, partnering with organizations such as People for the American Way, the Center for American Progress, Rock the Vote, and many others. Rob Ritchie, an expert on international and domestic elections and electoral form, has directed FairVote since its founding in 1992. Among his activities at FairVote, Rob has been a guest on many radio and television program, programs and has been a frequent source for print, radio, and television journalists. Before co-founding FairVote and become its director in 1992, he worked for three winning congressional campaigns in Washington State and for nonprofit organizations in Washington and the District of Columbia. Our co-sponsor for tonight's event, Fair Vote, educates and empowers Americans to remove the structural barriers to achieving a representative democracy in a way that respects every vote and every voice in every election. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and please join us in the lobby for a short reception following this program tonight. And Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to our panel. Thank you for all of you um, for being here tonight on a cold evening. So I thought what we do is open it up um, uh, to some quick comments by the panel here. And then uh, we're gonna have a conversation and we're gonna pretty quickly get to questions. So those of you who have questions, um, we'll be calling upon you in a little bit. So uh, uh, be patient. And those of you who, 
who might develop questions in listening to this, jot them down and we'll get to you. So Governor Dean and uh, Rob and Ann, what are two or three things that, that, that you might suggest folks know or think about as, you, as, as they contemplate or as, as folks contemplate how to get millennials more involved, how to make the process a little bit more fair, how to make sure that it recognizes every vote in every election? Governor? Uh, well, first, um, I, we're going to do a quick Vermont history lesson. I appreciate the uh, introduction, but it was not accurate. Uh, I am the longest serving governor in history. <laughs> <laughs> and the best. But no, I'm not the longest serving governor in the history of Vermont. Because Vermont, I love to say this compared to Texans particularly, Vermont was an independent republic for 14 years from 1777 to 1791. At that time, Thomas Chittenden was elected governor for eight consecutive one-year terms. Uh, when the Vermont then became a state, he was elected to nine more consecutive one-year terms, so he served 17 years. He is the longest-serving governor in the history of Vermont, but since eight of those terms were during the Republican <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Some of your friends from Texas, they're not the only ones that were in an independent republic. Um, so, I, we decided we're each going to take about four minutes to talk about this, and then so we can open it up and have as much Q&A as possible. Uh, first of all, I don't call your generation millennials. I call your generation first globals. And it, I, it's a term I stole from a Republican pollster, John Zogby, who wrote, actually wrote a book with that in the title. And the reason is, I think what's going on in this country is also going on elsewhere. Oh, I'm supposed to turn on my mic. How about this? Exactly. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Um, so uh, the reason I call them first globals and the reason I lifted the title from John Zogby is because this is a global phenomenon, not an American phenomenon. Uh, it started in America, really it was empowered by America. Uh, my theory about how this all works is that our generation was very, very different than our parents' generation. Our parents' generation got home from World War II they wanted nothing better to settle down, have kids, go back to a life after a pretty extraordinary set of life experiences, both good and horrendous, during the war. Uh, there was really very little understanding between my parents' generation and us. Uh, I think we came to love and respect each other, but the country was really torn in half. Uh, I, I lived through those 60s. Uh, not everybody did. Before, uh, students at Kent State, un unarmed student at Kent State University, were assassinated essentially by the armed National Guard, who fired their weapons at an un unarmed group of students. Uh, not so terribly different than what's going on in Ukraine right now. And it was extraordinary. Uh, and it was an extraordinary thing that how divided this country was. We reacted very differently. We essentially, I, th I, I would argue, we parented ourselves in many ways, and we parented the next generation in a way that I think was much different. There's a lot of dialogue that goes on between you, our children, and us. And, and we talk about things my, we never would have talked to uh, with my parents. Um, and why does this matter? Because I think uh, we conveyed the message to you that as individuals, you mattered and your opinion mattered, even though you might be five years old. It didn't mean your opinion carried the day, but it mattered and you were listened to and taken seriously. It's derided by you know, arts conservatives but in the child rearing. Uh, and colonists with nothing better to do than as the, the everybody's special generation. I have little patience with that kind of stuff. Uh, and then along comes the internet, which is the most extraordinary individually empowering uh, invention since the printing press 500 years previously. And now you have this sense that you can accomplish a great deal, that you're worth something, and you have the ability to do it outside the political process. So my argument is going to be this is the same kids that, that were involved in my campaign and elected Barack Obama president the first time were also the kids that did Tahrir Square and did the Green Revolution, which failed in Iran, uh, and have done many things like this uh, all over the world. And I, I think, uh, as one of the activists at Tahrir Square said, uh, after I asked I, who I keep up with, I, I said to him, well, what, how do you feel now that your revolution has not only been hijacked by the Brotherhood, but now you're back to square one with Mubarak? And they said, eventually we're going to win. Our generation, it's like this all over the world. Uh, we, we don't support authoritarianism. We value democracy. We value individually right, individual rights, and eventually we will win. Um, that is a pretty extraordinary statement given what's going on in Egypt and how serious their setbacks are. So I, I'm really looking forward to this hour because I think it's, it's going to be fun to talk about your generation. But I think you have already dramatically changed the political process in this country. 
Uh, we need a lot of political reforms. You interestingly have done it uh, without actually using the political process very much. Uh, you use it when you can, when you need it, but really the major reforms that are taking place because of your generation are outside the political process or in spite of it instead of because of it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, um, it's great to be here. Uh, you know, I think that when, I've worked with the millennial generation in a lot of different contexts, both as an organizer working on campaigns to engage young people in sort of the traditional grassroots organizing uh, electoral world, but also through community organizing and labor unions, and um, now with the Center for American Progress. And at Generation Progress, what we, the way that we approach engaging millennials is really a three-part strategy. So when we work with young people, we talk about ideas, action, and voices. So our generation, 95 million strong, I totally agree with the governor, are going to make change. We are the generation that is going to push the envelope and to kind of push elected officials and decision makers, both here and abroad, to sort of be more progressive and be more inclusive. And we have to have the ideas and the policy and the research to really ground our activism in um, sort of the, the political system as it exists and where the political system needs to change, we need to be able to communicate that. So ideas is all about what are the big ideas for our generation? How do we solve policy challenges that we have? Action is organizing, community-based organizing. Um, if ideas is federal legislative focused, action has to be about engaging young people where they are in their communities. We do a ton of work with um, young leaders around the country who are running issue-based campaigns in their communities. And I actually think that is a key in engaging young people, is that whether it's you know, El Cambio, which is an organization that we work with in um, North Carolina, or the Ohio Student Association, young people will work on issues that matter to them in their communities. They'll organize, they'll create coalitions, they'll work with you know, local leaders, they'll work with their peer groups, and they will figure out how to make change. Sometimes that might be through the electoral process, sometimes it might be starting nonprofits, it might be doing advocacy work, but that sort of grassroots organizing, face-to-face, -face, real people conversation about building power at the local level has to be a part of how you build sort of the power of the millennial generation. And voices, the third piece of the work that we do, is how do you lift up the voices of the millennial generation and get them into the political dialogue? So, I mean, that can be things like using the internet and using blogs and using social media and you know, Snapchat and Instagram and all the other ways that young people communicate is to be able to use those communications vehicles to talk about politics and to talk about civic engagement and our democracy in a way that actually engages people where they're at. And so <clears throat> I think you have to combine all of those things. And you have to do it around issues that actually matter to young people. So you, know, you can't have a disconnected conversation in Washington, DC, and expect young people to get excited about what's happening in some regulatory thing in Congress. It's just, it's just not, that's not the way it's going to work. You have to have a combination of what are the big ideas that create change? How do we organize at the local level to make that happen? And how do we lift the voices of these young people that are doing great work to push the conversation forward? OK. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I guess my mic is on, so that's good. Um, so, right, thanks to NYU for um, uh, hosting again. This, this has been a terrific series of events. And this is a good conversation, and it's, it's really getting to the core of our, um, what we need to do going forward. But part of that introduction was that we need to um, think about our 18th century electoral rules and 19th century party system. And um, I think that they've combined to create uh, real barriers to entry and, and to sustaining value to participation. Um, one thing I get to do in my job is, is talk to groups of visitors from um, other countries. And one regular gig I do is talking to people, young, young, young people from Eastern Europe, the, the, the former Soviet republics, um, some uh, Asian countries. And there'll be like a group of maybe 125 kids and they are so full of questions about electoral rules and process. Like I'm really interesting to them, and <laughs> and, and you know, so like I'm talking about rules, and they're just like full of questions because it's all new and exciting, and they're they're doing these things, even though some of their countries are really not doing that great a job, but they have some hope of making them better. And that's often not the case here. And I think that it's partly tied to uh, you know these rules and structures that 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 are getting in the way, and. Um, we need to find a way that, that, that people can come together 
and organize and affect government. At, at the end of the day, it's great to work outside of government and do all the remarkable things that were talked about. But at the end of the day, government is this potential instrument for the public good, or it should be, that if it's not doing that job, it's, it's really creating a big hole in, in you know, what we can do. And, and the, um, you know, the, so there's, that's the focus of what Fair Vote does. Um, I, I, I'm actually replacing tonight our chair, Chris Novoselic, who was in Los Angeles last night picking up a Grammy. Um, and um, uh, so he, I couldn't be here, but, but, but Chris has a vision of politics that I think speaks directly to this, which is that we need to change voting rules so there's real access, there's real opportunities to organize and start winning something uh, when you organize well. It's not a winner take all where if, if, if you only get 20%, that actually should count for something. 20% is actually a lot. Um, we uh, shouldn't be feeling that voting for a candidate who only gets 10% or 20% is a wasted vote. And we um, need to be able to associate and, and, and connect with, with one another in a way that can happen more within the, the two-party system, but also can expand the two-party system. And, 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 and that part of what I think that the uh, United States needs to do is evolve its system, move those, those 17th and 18th century models into the um, the 21st century, and the fact is we can. It's all statutory. It, it's, it's, it's all about organizing. We often accept these rules as immutable or, or these things as things that can't be changed, but in fact they can be. So all the things that we work on are all statutes and things that are, are something we can organize to change. It's not going to be easy to get the politicians to do it, but it's something that we can do. So what are the two things that you think most need to be changed at the statutory level to open it up? Well, I'll talk about one specific idea. It's one that the governor and I have, are, are both fans of, which is the idea of a ranked choice voting ballot, um, which that if uh, anyone has uh, supported a candidate that didn't seem like they had a chance to win, either in, in a primary or in a, uh, a nonpartisan election or in a general election where maybe they're a third party or an independent candidate, um, in our current mode where you can just vote for one, and that vote, that candidate might get 10% or whatever it is. Um, and people say, well, it's just never going to be enough. Um, then there's this, that's a wasted vote. Uh, or it seems like that candidate could be a spoiler, could undercut a majority winner. In a ranked choice system, which is now used in a, uh, more than a dozen cities in the US, it's a common model in a lot of NGO elections in other countries, you get to say who your first choice is, but you get to indicate a backup choice as your second choice and then your third choice. And that simple act of adding more to your ballot, being able to say more on your ballot, which, by the way, I think the ballot can have more on it about people, but it also you can put more on it with a ranked choice system. Um, and then you, uh, you add up the first choices. And if you have a majority winner, you're done. But if not, that candidate who is in that quote unquote spoiler position or the candidates who are in the, uh, uh, the lowest uh, voter, voted candidates, they're dropped and their ballots we already have the information from them about what those voters want, and you can just add them to their second choices. It can sound complicated, but from a voter's perspective, it's just doing what actually most of us are ready to do, which is say, well, that's my favorite, but that's my backup, that's my second favorite, that's my third, and allowing them to express the information they have. And suddenly, all these contortions we go through with saying, oh, third parties and independents are you know, splitting the vote, uh, suddenly, they're part of the process. Their ideas can be fully engaged. Um, if they're good ideas, those votes will rise, but people will need to compete for their vote. And, and, and so that that way of kind of isolating participation or dampening it can uh, be reversed. So it sounds a little theoretical um, and maybe <coughs> academic, but Governor, <coughs> 1998, you had, a, you had a circumstance where there was a candidate on the left, on the far left. You were the Democratic nominee and the <coughs> and best, longest serving and best Governor in Vermont, <laughs> and you had a Republican. Second opponent. longest serving in Vermont, longest serving in the state. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you had a Republican opponent on the right. And so, tell so this rank voting or lack of rank voting can have a very real impact. Al Gore saw in Florida in 2004, right. or in, I'm sorry, in 2000, how how real the impact can be. But can you share a little bit from the two, from the 1998 election, and, uh, and how it <coughs> well been different? Let's talk about Gore and Nader and Bush. I mean, there's no question if you'd had ranked choice voting in 19, in 2000, Al Gore would have been president, and we wouldn't have been we wouldn't have gone to Iraq, uh, which would have made all the difference. Um, so um, the way it works is, and you don't waste your vote on Ralph Nader. The Ralph Nader people don't get told that you just don't don't waste your vote. 
In fact, they may rank him first, but who would they rank second? And most likely would have been Al Gore, and that would have been the end of the problem. Uh, in my own race, uh, I was the, probably you know, the first um, governor in the country to do marriage equality. And it didn't go over very well with the public uh, when the legislature passed it in response to a court ruling that said our marriage laws were unfair, which they were. So at, at that moment, a progressive, and it's a pretty progressive state, chose to run against me for governor in the third party. I ended up with 50.1% of the vote, and the Republican got 37, and uh, the progressive got 10. But had I, not, had I gotten under 50.0, the legislature, which had, of course, lost a, a lot, tremendous number of Democrats as a result of this civil unions bill, uh, would have elected the governor and I would have been out of a job, even though I'd gotten more votes than everybody else. So it, ranked choice voting makes much more sense. There are a lot of places, including um, Minneapolis, uh, who, which, uh, which does use this, and a, a lot more places should use it, and in fact, the country as a whole ought to use it. Oh, yeah, and you talked about you talked about ideas, actions, and voices, and and it's interesting to me, you know, because some candidates do very very well uh, attracting millennials because of the ideas that they put mm -hmm. forth. And a candidate that comes to mind is Governor Dean when he ran in two thousand four against the Iraq War at a time when everybody was in favor of it. Other candidates seem to attract kind of movement um, forces behind them, sort of just because of who they are, like. Barack Obama in 2008. What is it that you think gets millennials interested in a candidate or a cause or an election? Is it an issue? Is it a personality? Is it, is it something else? What, what do you see and hear from folks you talk to? I mean, I think all the polling and sort of looking at how young people identify in terms of politics is increasingly young people don't identify with a political party. However, they identify as progressive. And when you kind of get down to the issues, whether it be marriage equality, like 86% of millennials support gay marriage. I mean, it's like not an issue anymore in our generation. You know, 15 years ago, it was a huge issue. And there were elections that were, you know, determine the outcome of cities and states and governors races that were all based on marriage equality. And it's just a non-issue anymore. So I think that when you look at the way that this generation has grown up and grown into the political sort of consciousness, it's very movement driven. Whether it's movement driven around issues or movement driven around individuals, it's not about partisan politics. And I think that is a challenge for us because our system is so, so partisan, so two party sort of um, driven, that the bickering and the frustration of the inability to move things is the challenge that I think we face because we have a generation of people who are pragmatic, who are diverse, who are educated, who want to see things happen and want to see things change, that when they can identify with a candidate who says, I want to do those things too, um, that that's when you start mm -hmm. to see young people engaging in the electoral process in, I think, a more substantial way. See, I, I, would, make, I would argue, though, that <clears throat> what this generation has done is use the internet to establish much more transparency in politics. It doesn't seem, you know, with all this discussion of big money and all those kinds of things, sure, there are forces in American politics that want less transparency. You can't get away from it. And think the most damaging thing that Mitt Romney did was to have somebody with a cell phone record him saying 47% of the people in the country are all, you know, on the public dole and they don't care. I mean, that was the end. He was, he, I think he did, did himself in the way he talked about Latinos in the debates, but I mean, this was really the final killer. And look what Edward Snowden has done. Uh, for better or for worse, he's begun a discussion we should have had a long time ago about the government spying on people with or without our consent. He's a 29-year-old guy now. He, he, he put out something on WikiLeaks. We never would have gotten that kind of information. Daniel Ellsberg stole the Pentagon Papers in my generation, but the, 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 all that did was prove that Nixon had done and said a number of things that he deni had denied that didn't have anything close to the huge scope uh, that Snowden did. And so I think, I think this generation is already transforming everything. Mm -hmm. I think this generation is the, is the generation that's transforming the debate on marriage equality uh, and getting uh, older folks who are struggling with it to come along. This generation is now in the process of transforming the Republican Party. Why is that? Because they know they can't win without you and they can't continue to talk the way they talk about uh, Muslims, gays, immigrants, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, all of whom, you, women, all of whom, you know, exactly. <laughs> oh, sure there's that. I mean, there's the 51% of the electorate, right? Is or actually 52 or 3% because women vote in a higher percentage than men do. And, and they know they got to stop it. And they're busy trying to figure out how to do it. And every day they just, or they just ask somebody to resign from Michigan, who was sort of the Rush Limbaugh of the Michigan Republican Party. Um, and they, they have no choice. In order to compete, you're forcing that because the older you get and the more in the process you get, the more you force that to happen. So I, I've got a lot more to say about it. I'm not going to use the airtime now. <laughs> but um, I actually think that you are transforming the political process, even though you don't really aren't that comfortable in the political process, with the exception of my campaign and the, and the, and the Obama campaigns. And now maybe you'll become more comfortable as time goes on. I think that's our goal. But I think, as Ann said, I don't think you're going to get into there, there's There are some of you, and I, I know who you are, uh, who love politics and are just as much junkies as we are. But most of you get involved in politics because of a particular issue or because of a particular candidate that appears to be a change agent. So Rob, you mentioned modernizing the electoral system, and, and you specifically talk about ranked voting. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if like Apple can put fingerprint recognition on an iPhone, so that you can touch it and, and it recognizes you, it validates you, and you can get on your phone. Why don't we have that for voting? Why don't you move to the next, to the next generation, if you will, of updating the electoral process and say, it's time for online voting, it's time for that kind of recognition. And then perhaps we can get rid of all these, all these challenges that the Republicans do routinely to people who want to vote. All right. Well, people care a lot about the counting of votes and their trust in the process, and there's still a lot of distrust about what internet voting could be used to do in a way that people don't want. You know, like the, the actual counting of votes and the manipulation of votes, people want to make sure that that's votes counted. I think we are in an, an inevitable transition on the <coughs> fundamentals of voting. Um, take as a sort of a step back even from the casting the vote, you know, a voter registration. Um, he, he, here we are in the modern era, and you know we, we barely have two-thirds two -thirds of eligible voters are registered to vote, um, and uh, you know it's just crazy. You know, it, and 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 as uh, people leave leave high school, thinking mean, about the way that we we respect young people's participation, we have all these young people in our school system, you know, getting to be 18, barely half of them are registered to vote when they leave. We did a study in our own community of Tacoma Park, and uh, p eligible voters who are 18 to 30 in local elections, less than 1% of them were voting in local elections. Um, 18 to 30. <clears throat> now, it gets older. You know, it, it, it gets a little higher w when they get older. But uh, um, you know, so, so there's so some basic things that we can do a lot better. I think the, the actual act of casting the vote is, is, is going to be something to look at. I think that why people don't participate isn't the difficulties in that act of casting the vote, and you can tell the difference because the very same rules for casting the ballot, like having to go to voting machines and whatnot, uh, if you have that local election, it might be 7%, and you have a presidential race, it's 65%. You know, like the same voters can react differently, but it's what they have to vote for and what they believe in. And some of the, the, the things people have talked about, about where we've had where we've seen millennials have an impact, the, the uh, Governor Dean's campaign, Barack Obama, uh, Ron Paul, I mean, these, 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 these kinds of campaigns, they often don't translate to congressional elections because of rules and because of the opportunity to make change that feels possible. Um, and there's a whole set of rule changes that uh, we'd like to see at that level also, but that um, we uh, need to look at what people are voting for fundamentally. Okay. So does anybody, we'll continue this conversation unless folks have questions, in which case somebody pop up and ask a question, um, and we'll, we'll go for a little while that way. There's a microphone, I think, on both sides, so feel free to ask it, and um, we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of direct them a little bit, unless you've got a specific question for a specific person. Hi, I'm Jeff Pudlow. I'm with a group called the Peace Alliance. My uh, question is, um, to anyone really, Given our generation's kind of reluctance to engage in politics, and given the structural barriers that exist, how do we encourage more millennials to run for office themselves? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Gavin. Um, this, uh, this sort of goes to the two, what I see is the, the weakness of, of, the, of the first globals. Um, and actually, one of them is not a weakness, but 
The first is um, your.